Hi everyone, Nick Sharapi here. Welcome to Edge Online Season 2, Episode 2. Last week we talked about the most iconic person in all of history. Yeah, it's Jesus. What, what do you think it was going to be? This is, this is a religion video. Of course we're going to be talking about Jesus. But yeah, I mean, he was, he's so integrated into our entire culture. If he's iconic, it is so cold outside. It's so cold outside. I need to go inside. If Jesus was, oh, the wind. If he was so iconic, then the next question is, are you going to be a fan? Will you be a fan of Jesus? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and ask people if they're fans of Jesus and then ask them why. And I'm not going to prepare them. And we'll see what they say. Hey, Janet. Yeah. Do you love Jesus? Yeah. Why? Because I like love and love is cool and love is Jesus. Cool. Hey, Marilyn. Hey, Nick. Are you a fan of Jesus? Hallelujah, Nick. Woo. Hey, Jason. Yeah. Are you a fan of Jesus? Of course I am. Well, why? Well, when you think back to the first question in the Baltimore Catechism, right? What is the meaning of man's existence? Why are we here? It's to know, love, and serve God. And so... Approximately 10 hours later. That's <laughs> why I'm a fan of Jesus. Wow, that was so interesting. Yeah. I know, hey, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Lee. Are you a fan of Jesus? Yeah, leave me alone. Hello. Oh. Hey, are you a fan of Jesus? I am! Why? Uh, because he makes me sing spiritually and he's the only one who um, turns my sadness into joy! <laughs> Salve Regina! Come on, are you? Nick, leave me alone. It's for the kids! Leave me alone, Nick. O okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay, but let's hear someone's entire story about why they really love Jesus and how he changed his life. Coming up next is Don Ruby giving a witness talk that I really think you'll like. Ah! So I was asked to, to come to you all this week, right, and, and talk about um, my, my journey to finding uh, a relationship with Christ, right? And I would tell you that I can remember being your age, trust me, like it was yesterday. The hairstyles might have been different, the music and the clothes were different, but everything that we did kind of mimics what, what you all do today, right? There were parties, there were girlfriends, there were boyfriends, there were things that we should do, things that we shouldn't do, right? And all of that stuff I was involved in. Right? And I can, I can remember thinking that, it, looking for inclusion, and we would go to parties because that's where you would be included. You'd be one of the popular people, right? Going to, to, to out with friends, right? Getting a girlfriend because that would, that would mean that we would find that inclusion, we would find that sense of fulfillment. And I would for, for very short times, right? And then me and my friends and me and my girlfriend or girlfriends, depending on what time of, of, of my life it was, right? We would keep going forward and, and trying to find all of those things within each other. I remember coming home from each, each party the next day and feeling like, oh, I had a great time tonight, but if I want to get that sense of inclusion and belonging, I have to do it again, right? And then each time that we would go to one of those events, it would have to be bigger than the last, right? The party had to be bigger. The activities had to be bigger, they had to be larger than life to, to get that same sense of belonging and fulfillment that, that we got before. Right? And with my girlfriend, you know, th things have to get a little more involved, if you would, because that's what we needed to feel, that sense of fulfillment, that sense of inclusion, that sense of love. And the one thing I never thought about was that every time I came here to this church building, to my church building, when I was in middle school and high school, you know, my mom made me go every Sunday. Right? There'd be many Sundays that I would be there and I would not hear a thing that the, the priest was saying. But I can remember, as I look back on it, that always feeling a sense of inclusion, right? A sense of love, maybe a sense of being held, if you would. I graduated from high school and went on, and in college life, I continued with the parties and the girlfriends and all the things that the world told me that I should be doing if I wanted to feel included, if I wanted to feel loved, if I wanted to feel that life was worth living. And every single one of those things continued to fail me. Right? For the moment, the parties were bigger, you know, the things that we did were grander, right? Um, but there was still only that sense of momentary inclusion or momentary fulfillment, maybe for the day, maybe for the week, but it would soon go away, right? And I continued to have girlfriends and, and really looking for that love and that inclusion. And sometimes it was there and sometimes it wasn't, right? So, so we would look at that and think, okay, what do we have to do to bring that, that into our relationship? I would go to Mass every once in a while. Um, I went to an urban campus, so there were churches around, right? And I would find myself coming into the church building every once in a while, these big cavernous buildings. 
and I would find peace and I would find comfort, but still not understanding what all of that meant, right? And I got to be just a little bit older um, and, and realize that maybe it wasn't all about me, right? Somebody introduced me to an activity and I realized that it wasn't all about me. And only when I realized that it wasn't all about me did I realize what it was about. Falling at his feet, right? Falling at the foot of the cross. If I really wanted to feel loved and included and understand what my role was in life, it was to fall at the foot of the cross. We have this thing called free will, right? And I used my free will to do everything that I pleased, right? And everything that I wanted, thinking that it was what would bring me fulfillment. It was what would bring me joy. And it was all self-centered. It was all about me. It was all about this heart and what I was doing to make my life better. And all I had to do was fall at the foot of the cross. I would tell you to take a look inside and everything that you're doing, everything that you're doing, whether it be sinful or whether it not be sinful, are you doing it for yourself, for, for your own well-being, your own good, you think? Or are you doing it for, for the good of the other? Because until you find that moment, until you realize the joy, the joy in falling at the foot of the cross, the joy in giving it, surrendering it all to him, as opposed to trying to take everything on yourself, your heart's going to continue to be empty, right? You're going to keep chasing that next thing and it's probably going to be more and more sinful as you keep chasing those things of this world. The moment that I fell at the foot of the cross, the moment I began to surrender it all to him, was when I realized what this life was all about. Love you guys and I'm praying for you. Okay, so I'm a huge fan of the singer, the rock and roll singer from the 1970s. His name is Meatloaf. And I loved him because he was super duper dramatic. I went to one of his concerts once and I was in the third row, which was awesome because like at this concert in downtown Pittsburgh, he passed out. And I, everyone thought that my favorite music artist died. Like I knew everything about this guy. I knew his autobiography. I was such a big fan. The weird thing about being a fan with a guy named Meatloaf is that, uh, one, it's not very cool to be a fan of a guy named Meatloaf, but two, being a fan of someone who doesn't know you back is weird. Like, ask yourself a question. Are you a fan of any, like, I don't know, sports players or uh, a fan of any musician? What do you know about them? You probably know a lot, but that relationship is one-sided, right? You know a ton about them, but what do they know about you? Not so much. See, when we're fans of Jesus, it's a little bit different. Things are a little bit different. When we become fans of Jesus, it's not a one-way street. Like, I know who Ben Roethlisberger is, but he doesn't know me. And if I saw him randomly at like a Verizon wireless store or at the Apple store, I wouldn't know what to say to him. I would know him, but he wouldn't know me. The thing is, Jesus knows you and he loves you. So to talk a little bit more about like Jesus and how being a fan of his and a follower of his actually affects your life. We're going to toss it over to Maria. Jesus continues to impact the world, not because he was an important historical figure, but because he is God and his life shows us what we need to know about God. Through every action and word of Jesus, we see the love and mercy of God. We see that he cares about the things that we care about. He cares where our friends are. He cares if we're lonely. He cares if we're sad or if we're happy. He cares about every detail of our lives. God wants to teach us what truth is and to see us do good in our own lives. Through Jesus we learn that God doesn't leave us when we make bad choices, but he does hold us accountable and he wants us to come to him and experience his mercy and his forgiveness, especially through the sacrament of reconciliation. Jesus reveals God's great mercy to us and shows us that God loves us even to the point of dying for us, no matter how much we sin or how much we turn away from him. He always gives us a chance to come back. When I was in high school, I would sit in the cafeteria at lunchtime and watch penguins practice on my laptop. And I followed what they did every day. I was following every single trade, every single game, um, any type of move that they made. I could tell which players were on the ice by how they skated. I watched so many games. I had penguins fat heads in my bedroom. I didn't go to prom because I wanted to watch penguins game. <laughs> 
But what I realized later, hockey was my thing in high school, but hockey never changed my life. It was a fun hobby. I loved watching the games. I still watch the games. It was always a one-sided admiration. Now our relationship with Jesus is just that. It's not a one-sided admiration. It's a relationship of friendship with our Lord. Jesus doesn't want us to follow him for the sake of his own fame, but for us to have fullness of life and to follow his example and really find happiness in him. He shows us what it means to live a full, worthwhile, and holy life. And all through the Gospels, he makes extraordinary promises to those of, us who, uh, those of us who follow him, that we'll never be hungry, that we'll never be thirsty, that we'll never die, that all we have to do is ask him and he'll give us good things. And while he gave his followers 2,000 years ago literal bread to eat, today he gives us something even better. He gives us his body and blood in the Eucharist so that we'll never hunger or thirst for his love. When I found a group of hockey players I admired, I followed them on social media, I watched them, um, all of their games, and being a follower of Jesus is so much more than that. To be a follower of Jesus, we have to believe that he is God, and when we believe that our lives are lived according to his teachings, and we end up loving each other as he loved us, we become a part of the community of the church that he established for us, and we draw near to him in the sacraments that he has given us. Following Jesus is not always easy, and while he asks us of our full self, he gives us 100-fold in return in giving us his full self. We don't just admire Jesus from afar, we don't um, hear about him at a distance. His stories apply to our lives today, and we invite him to, into every part of our lives, that he might fill us with his love and transform every aspect of our hearts and of our lives. And in the end, unlike the hockey players that I love to watch, or maybe the bands, um, musicians, or actors, or actresses that you like to follow, we actually get to share in the success of Jesus in a real way. We share in his triumph over the cross and over death, and we get to share in heaven with him at the end of time. Okay, so question. Have you been watching this video so far and thinking to yourself, I know, I've heard this stuff before. I've heard uh, that I should have a relationship with Jesus. I've heard that Jesus loves me. I've heard uh, all this stuff before. Are you one of those people? Be honest right now. Because I've heard that Jesus loves me a million times. I grew up Catholic. I actually grew up at this church. And every priest who's ever been here, and every CCD teacher, and every catechesis teacher, and everyone, and my parents, and uh, they've all told me, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. It's funny, like so many things in this world don't love us. The people that we're fans of don't love us back. But Jesus does, and we've heard it a million times that Jesus loves you. Now here's the thing, I can know something up here because I've heard it before. But knowing something in your heart is way different. How do we learn in our hearts that Jesus loves you? It's to hear his voice. It's something that is not like only priests can do. It's not like only holy people can hear God's voice. You can hear God's voice too. Your creator, the reason for existence, the reason for the whole universe, wants to speak to you. That's cool. And so many people don't know that. And so many other people don't believe that. So when I say, and when everyone says that Jesus loves you and he wants to be close to you through the Eucharist and all these things, we're not just saying it because we're being paid to or something weird like that. We're saying it because it's true. And when, when Jesus said, I love you to Don, and when Jesus says, I love you to Maria, or when Jesus says, I love you to me, or your priest, it changes everything. When Jesus says, I love you to you, it changes your life. It will. So how do we hear Jesus say, I love you to you or to someone else? It's through prayer. And so Jonah's gonna give you another tip for prayer this week. I hope you like it. How's it going guys, Jonah here. And uh, today for our prayer, we're gonna be doing things a little bit differently. I'm gonna teach you guys a way to pray, um, a form of intercessory prayer. So praying for other people. 
And um, it, it's based on a passage from John, the, the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, whatever you ask for the Father in my name, he will give to you. And um, a lot of times we hear that phrase and we end up just kind of tacking on Jesus' name to the end of prayers, right? We, we say like, Lord, please do this for us. Uh, help me with my tests, uh, whatever it is. And, and we just say, in your name, amen. And we just kind of tack it on. But what does it really mean to pray for something in Jesus' name? And to get the context of that, we have to go back a little bit and, and understand that, you know, in the times of the kings in, in the ancient world, when the king would send his messengers out, they would proclaim things in the name of the king. And it was always a message that was given by the king. You know, to, to, to speak on behalf of the king, there's this, um, this understanding that, that it's what the king wants. So what I, I want to try doing today with you guys is um, when we pray intercession, when we pray for other people, when we pray for things going on in the world, we take a moment and we just ask God what he wants us to pray for. So we're going to pray for things. We're, we're going to ask God for, for something now. But before we do that, we're going to ask what he wants. What does he want us to pray for? Who does he want us to pray for? Is there a, there a situation in someone's life, um, a, a relative, a f- friend, a family member, someone like that, that, that you really feel like God's asking you to pray for them? So we're going to take a moment and begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Lord, we just come before you and we ask you to reveal to our hearts what it is or who it is that you want us to pray for and how you would like us to pray for them. And just take a moment and think about that. Push distractions aside and just ask the Lord to put it on your heart. Who does he want you to pray for right now? How does he want you to pray for them? And then once you have that intention, um, pray for that person. You know, maybe you pray a decade of the rosary if you're you're feeling like it, or maybe just like an Our Father or um, whatever it is, pray for that intention. Ask the Lord to to make a difference in that person's life or in this situation. Um, Give that a shot and and try doing that every day. Um, Some of you guys might have this spirituality of intercessory prayer. This might be something that you really love doing. And if that's the case, do it. Um, And it's cool because, you know, Sometimes you really see God answer prayers. It does happen. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, maybe it means that he has another plan. And um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it still opens our hearts to pray in this way. So give it a shot. Try it. Do it often. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. God bless. Have you been back to church since this whole pandemic thing has started? <sighs> I know a lot of people can't, and I know a lot of people haven't, and they're super bummed about it. But I just want you to know that I'm praying for you, that all the youth ministers are praying for you, that the priests are praying for you, and that we all care about you, both in the church and away from the church. So, hey, if you need anything, reach out to us. Come say hello, and we'll keep making these videos. We hope you like them. If there's anything you want us to talk about in these videos, like you have any questions, let us know. We'd love to answer them. Anyway, from all of us at Edge Online, we'll see you next time.